Good morning and welcome to day two. Uh, trust everybody had uh, uh, a pleasant evening last night and I've, I've enjoyed what pieces of the uh, informal conversations that I've been able to pick up on. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, we're going to shift today into uh, less of a, um, a, a, an academic study, if you will, of fisheries law and the other fish management schemes and laws that intersect with them and really dive into some of the, frankly, uh, challenging issues that fisheries management and all ocean managers are up against these days. Uh, so we're, we're very fortunate today to have um, a diversity of viewpoints and a diversity of backgrounds, which as I mentioned yesterday, I think is reflective of the challenges of these issues. They're just much more interdisciplinary, they're much more complicated, um, as if developing an FMP under Magnuson isn't complicated enough. Uh, but we're, we're going to talk about catch shares and, re and those types of allocation schemes this morning um, and then go into sort of the kitchen sink panel uh, at the end with uh, energy issues and marine spatial planning uh, under, under that larger rubric of challenges of the future and how an existing scheme and an existing law is going to fit into this brave new world that we're entering. So before we do that, we're, uh, we're very lucky to have Eric Schwab here, and I'm going to let Dean Logan introduce him. Thank you, Susan. And uh, I wish I had been here for the dinner last night. Um, I had an event up in Boston I had to go to, but uh, I heard uh, lots of interesting conversations were, were uh, rebounding around the, around the hall. Uh, as I said yesterday, this is really a wonderful opportunity for Roger Williams to bring together experts from a broad range of disciplines and from different perspectives to talk about uh, the, the challenges um, historically and now facing us um, involving fisheries management. And as Susan said, we put together a really remarkable collection of people. And the, uh, the, the next speaker is no exception. Eric Schwab is the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries at the National Marine Fisheries Service at NOAA. Uh, and has really quite a remarkable biography. Uh, you know, you're used to seeing people uh, who uh, uh, are in positions like this that have you know, long academic uh, pedigrees or they've got some political connection or whatever. Uh, Eric actually you know, started at the ground level working as a law enforcement officer in natural resources in Maryland and has over a 25-year career done a, a large range of activities in a broad range of professional settings including local, state, and national. Um, he has a very important job, as the title suggests, and we are delighted to have Eric Schwab with us today um, to speak to us as a keynote for today's part of the program. Eric. Thank you. Welcome. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I particularly want to thank Dean Logan, uh, Susan, the uh, university and the institute for putting on this program and inviting me to part participate. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday, and I'm just curious how many were. So almost everybody, I know I saw a few new faces uh, in the room today that weren't here yesterday. Uh, yesterday was a great uh, foundation with respect to all of the, of the current understandings, the evolution of Magnuson, the evolution of Magnuson in the context of a number of the other uh, natural resource statutes and natural resource settings that we operate within. And today becomes, I think, w uh, another really interesting uh, opportunity for us to discuss not so much the foundation, how we got here, but where we go from here, and particularly some of the cutting edge challenges and issues and opportunities that we face in implementing Magnuson within this brave new world. So I actually had uh, the good fortune of being here yesterday, which probably affords you maybe some good fortune in that I'm going to have significantly modified my presentation so as not to so as not to repeat everything that was said yesterday uh, in my keynote 
uh, which means that I, I'll also beg your indulgence if I jump around a little bit or my presentation seems uh, somewhat disconnected on occasion. It's because I'm trying to spare you, not so much uh, 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 a, a lack of, uh, of any preparation on my part. But the other thing that I, that, I, that I wanted to note in doing that, what I'm going to try to do is move less from uh, descriptive uh, approaches to more reflective approaches. So while you'll see in a PowerPoint slide some descriptive language, I will try to use that in a, a, a brief period of time here as a launching off point for, um, for some personal observations about how these things are or are not playing out in our uh, current implementation of Magnuson. I, I do want to note at the outset that I think much of what we heard yesterday and much of the challenge that we face um, is underlain by uh, a theme of tension and in many respects natural tensions. It's the, the tension between perfect science and best available science. It's the tension between rebuilding goals and the promise of long-term rebuilding and uh, current economic realities that uh, many fishermen and local communities face all around the country. Uh, it, it, it's actually, and we see, we're going to see this, I think, play out in some of the allocation discussions, particularly as it relates to cat share systems, uh, a little bit of a tension between and, and where we strike a balance between efficiency and equity in relation to historic uses. Uh, we'll, we also see growing tensions between uh, the prosecution of individual fisheries and the needs to recognize that those fisheries operate in are influenced by and influence broader ecosystems and, and, and broader socioeconomic systems. And so all of these tensions really come together in, I think, the here and now to present us some really important challenges but also some great opportunities to build on the past success of Magnuson in a way that will really help us uh, in, in, in social, economic, and environmental ways going forward uh, meet, meet even, even greater promise that's associated with uh, the, the, the coastal and ocean resources that we all share. I don't think, by the way, that those tensions, the other comment that I wanted to make at the outset, that, is that those tensions are necessarily unique to the ocean world or to implementation of, of Magnuson. But I would suggest that they're complicated, in fact, by a couple of things, one of which we talked about yesterday, and that is this. You know, we all face these kind of choices in our daily lives uh, and in our professional lives in all co kinds of ways. Uh, but, the, but the challenges in the ocean are complicated by uh, this common access issue, this potential tragedy of the commons that we heard reflected on yesterday. And I think it's challenged by another thing, and um, D Dean Logan mentioned my resume, and so I have some expertise earlier in my career in counting trees. Um, and one of the things that, one of the adages of the fishery scientists is that, you know, fish are as easy to count as trees, except they're underwater and they swim around. So we do have this, uh, what, what that suggests is this uh, underlying problem associated with recognizing our, the shared reality that we have to deal with. So it's too easy oftentimes to um, divert from uh, debates around honest policy choices into debates over what the current reality is, what the science is, what the economic impacts are. And I'll talk a little bit about that going forward. So what I really want to focus on here today, and this slide has been a little bit, da this is a bit dated by uh, some of the adjustments that I've made to this presentation, are really, uh, as I already alluded to, the opportunity for um, the gains as associated with Magnuson to date and the continued promise associated with uh, execution of Magnuson Act going forward. I really do want to focus on a few of the significant changes associated with the 2006 reauthorization. I want to talk about some of our particular implementation priorities within NOAA Fisheries. Uh, we heard a lot yesterday about uh, the various 
responsibilities that are, that are bestowed upon the agency, the, the fishery management councils, and the fishermen and the fishing communities associated with this new Magnuson. And uh, we can't satisfy all of those demands at, at, at once. In fact, we heard in some of the Q&A alluded to one of the demands that we're ex explicitly not meeting, up, meeting our, uh, our requirements on, and there are certainly others. Uh, and I do want to close with a few comments about the opportunity associated with the new national ocean policy and particularly coastal, the coastal and marine spatial planning focus of that national ocean policy. And uh, most importantly, what, I, what I'm hoping to do, although I look around the room and I see there's no, there are no clocks here, what I'm hoping to do is restrict my commentary to about 30 minutes and then leave plenty of opportunity for Q&A because, frankly, I know that's the most, most interesting part of the session for you, and it usually is for me as well. So we'll try to do that. And so, Susan, if you could help me in that regard. Uh, okay. So I don't wear, you know, I don't, probably like a lot of people, I don't wear a watch anymore. I look at my cell phone. So if I look at my cell phone, it's not because I'm, un I'm uninterested in what I have to say. <laughs> So I do want to talk a little bit about the opportunity associated with Magnuson reauthorization. You, you, you know, I think we, we think a lot about the application of Magnuson in the here and now in the context of impacts to fishermen and fishing communities. We hear certainly uh, a lot of that. Why can't we just leave things the way that they are? Well, of course, you know, the first part of that is that leaving things the way that they are is, is not necessarily a static or dependable circumstance. Many fisheries face challenges under their current, uh, under their current management framework. Uh, but more importantly is that many fisheries around the country, uh, not only from an ecosystem perspective, but even from a direct economic perspective, are underperforming. And we know that we have incredible rebuilding opportunities that are out there. Uh, based on uh, not only long-term histories, but even recent histories. And we know that increasing, that rebuilding all fish stocks will provide for us significant economic opportunity in the here and now, in these fishing communities. And this slide is just a quick uh, synopsis of uh, some of the current calculation associated with that potential opportunity. I would also note, by the way, that I think there were, there were a series of handouts, one-pagers, um, that were passed around the room that sort of, uh, well, some of them were passed around the room, there's some of them here, that, uh, that capture some of this data in, in uh, summary fashion, and uh, you're welcome to uh, use that in addition to whatever su uh, summary materials are going to be available ultimately online. So we heard a lot yesterday about the evolution of Magnuson uh, since its inception in 1976. I'm not going to dwell on um, that history again, other than to note that the evolution, I think, was not just one of, um, you know, some some uh, agency or, or uh, some Congress's uh, dastardly attempt to just make things more complicated over time. It really did reflect not only an evolution of the changing circumstances that the fisheries have found themselves in in relation to uh, uh, early implementation, but also a recognition of the increasing challenges that we face in managing these fisheries effectively within the context of what are very complicated ecosystems. And so as science improves, our need to manage more effectively within the context of that increased understanding obviously increases. And so uh, while the early days of fisheries were really about securing a uh, uh, domestic fishery, they were also about managing that domestic fishery in a, a very kind of single species fashion, if you will. And one of the evolutions, one of the, one of the important evolutions over time that we have seen unfold is first an understanding of 
the interactions among species. This continues to challenge us significantly in mixed stock species or even in management efforts where we seek to achieve maximum sustainable yield for um, species that in some cases eat each other. Uh, but we have also seen increasing recognition of the interactions not only of species with each other but with their habitats. And uh, we have seen in some places the carrying capacity of habitats decline. Uh, those are things that we have to take in uh, real consideration as we make management decisions. We have also, by the way, seen opportunities for fisheries to interact with and impact on their habitats. So this relationship between fisheries and their habitats is something that has increasingly been incorporated into management planning efforts going forward. And I would submit that, by the way, uh, it's not going to end there. Uh, we heard some uh, mention yesterday of uh, climate-related impacts. And so even as we move to an ecosystem-based approach to fisheries management, recognizing in the here and now the relationship between amongst species and between species and their habitats, we also are beginning to recognize that those habitats in time are not static circumstances. And in fact, uh, issues like global warming, issues like sea level rise have potential to, in many ways, affect the fishery resources that we manage and therefore uh, require consideration of the potential of those changes as we undertake management planning going into the future. And I'll just place that as sort of a bookmark for you uh, to think about going into the future. Let me just make, uh, highlight a couple of things at the outset uh, related to the 2006 reauthorization, uh, 2006, with deference to uh, Mike Connaughton. Are you still here, Mike? And the, and the, uh, <laughs> and, and the legislative process. Actually, I always have references as the 2006, uh, 2006 reauthorization, too, because I did have the opportunity in a, uh, a stint with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies to work on the 2006 reauthorization. And it was, um, by the way, uh, having worked on that and provided some language that ultimately was incorporated into one aspect of the bill, um, something that we thought was actually dead. We all went to sleep uh, in, in maybe the last night of that waning Congress in 2006 thinking that all of our work had gone for naught and woke up to find that in fact the, the, the act, the act was, was, had passed and uh, uh, it set, set us on the course that I think we're on today in, again, in many ways I think uh, affording us great opportunity to focus on some things that are, that are important going forward. So it mandates the use of annual catch limits and accountability measures to end overfishing, specifically put into place the requirement that we meet deadlines um, to put those measures into place and to meet specific deadlines relating to rebuilding stocks. And if you go back to uh, the, the the promise of the 90, 1996 reauthorization, you saw that desire to move in that direction, and I think what you saw re reflected in 2006 was, um, frankly, a, a dissatisfaction that um, deadlines had slipped and the promise of the 96 reauthorization associated with ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks had not been met, and perhaps um, on the part of at least um, some leaders in Congress, some, uh, some frustration with that fact. It also provides very specifically for uh, widespread use of uh, what uh, can be termed market-based management through limited access privileges uh, manifesting now in, under the terminology of cat shares. And I'm going to spend a few minutes um, going into a little more detail uh, on the cat share issue uh, here momentarily. And it calls for increased international cooperation. You'll see in a slide that I'll show you in a few minutes that um, there, is, uh, uh, there are con remain continued problems associated with ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks in um, stocks that we share uh, internationally. 
and there was a particular focus in this reauthorization in identifying the need for uh, stronger international, um, pres international presence and international negotiating uh, postures as it related to a number of those stocks. Uh, and it also strengthened, strengthened the role of um, science in management. I'll, I'll say more about that here in a moment, particularly as it relates to uh, councils. So, the, so, so uh, you know, the councils do do a great job. As we heard yesterday, the, uh, uh, the councils might not be perfect. The entire management system uh, is not perfect, but we heard reference twice yesterday to uh, the Churchill quote regarding democracy. And uh, I think it somewhat applies here because we do feel like the councils present an incredibly robust opportunity for uh, public input, uh, engagement with uh, not only the fishing community, but lots of other interests that have perspectives related to the marine and coastal environment. And the councils do provide for us uh, a very strong evaluation of options and a very strong application of um, the public input and public desires into, into, that, into that management process. Um, the councils ha have been historically challenged, uh, particularly when separating between uh, allocation issues and conservation issues. And I think one of the uh, points that you see reflected in that 2006 reauthorization which essentially at some level limited the council's ability to move outside of um, the advice of its scientific and, st and statistical committees uh, to focus really on um, let's first set the conservation threshold that we have to meet to end overfishing, to rebuild stocks, um, and to manage on a sustainable basis um, that we all seek to manage on. And then within, um, within that framework, let's make the rest of our management and allocation decisions without going back and compromising uh, on some of those conservation principles. So one of the things that the 2006 Act did was very clearly um, draw that line between when you're making conservation decisions and taking conservation action and when within the context of um, a, conserv a, a sustainability uh, framework, you can make appropriate uh, compromises related to allocation and other management uh, uh, actions. So I'm not going to focus on the na on national standard at all. Uh, I, I, I'll just again say that um, one of the things that the uh, 2006 reauthorization did was establish this requirement um, for creation of annual catch limits and accountability measures uh, by 2010 for fisheries undergoing overfishing and 2011 um, for uh, all of our major stocks. So I don't know if you can read the fine print there, um, but I have two maps. One is stocks subject to overfishing, uh, and, it, and uh, these are you know, out of our major stocks, and I think you find, um, even if you can't read the fine print there, uh, a rather interesting uh, uh, difference between West Coast and East and, East and Gulf Coast, and uh, I will... Uh, uh, allow you to uh, draw your own conclusions about that, but I would just offer um, a couple of comments. One is obviously many of these fisheries on the East Coast and in the Gulf are complex, both in uh, much more complex in the, the number and type of participants, uh, but also in the number of species that are involved. Uh, but in some cases, also when you get out of the West Coast, um, there is, particularly in Alaska, um, a longer history of dealing with some of these important uh, conservation uh, goals that, 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 uh, that, that are shared between the fishermen and the agency. Uh, and there's, we could spend hours um, teasing apart what that means, but um, this is at least, as it relates to our responsibility, uh, 
with the councils to address overfishing, a current snapshot of um, the world, at least the U.S. Uh, so for, for uh, rebuilding overfish stocks, so it's really important, and I know for um, a good part of the audience, uh, it's unnecessary for me to say this, but let me do it anyway for, um, for at least parts of the audience, uh, to distinguish between uh, overfished and overfishing, right? So overfished rep represents some abundance level that you think is appropriate in relation to the historical abundance levels of that particular stock. Um, and overfishing really relates specifically to the rate of removal of that stock. And so if you have, you can have a stock that is overfished in that its abundance is very low that may or may not be subject to any fishing at all. Alternatively, you can have a stock whose abundance is high but which is being exploited at a rate that threatens to uh, undermine that abundance over time. So you can have a relatively healthy stock um, that is in the short term subject to overfishing and therefore vulnerable to decline. Uh, alternatively, you can have a, an, o a, an overfished stock, one at low abundance, f whereby you've significantly re curtailed fishing, and it might even be on a rebuilding trajectory, just not, has not gotten there yet. Uh, but we do have specific requirements with respect to rebuilding overfish stocks that are articulated on this slide. And so here's a picture of the overfish stocks, and I'm not going to dwell on this other than to note that um, the 40 from the previous slide and the 47 from this slide um, don't necessarily perfectly overlap. And uh, so there are some that fall into one or both categories, uh, depending upon the circumstances that I just described. So we measure, pro so, we, so we also have this scientific challenge, which is our understanding of the status of stocks. Uh, we measure progress in rebuilding based on a fish stock sustainability index. It's very simple. It reflects um, the measure of increasing understanding of the primary stocks and their status as it relates to uh, overfished and overfishing. And so that you do see 21 stocks have been rebuilt since 2000. You do see significant not only increases in uh, the rebuilding process, but also reflected here uh, is an increased understanding of the status of many stocks. And when you go around the country, there are a lot of stocks for which um, we frankly lack uh, sufficient da data. And by the way, New England is probably the place where we suffer that problem the least. You go down into the South Atlantic, the Gulf Coast, one of the big problems is that we have major stocks that we have historically not had really good understanding of. So let me shift gears into cat shares. So I'm going a little over, I guess, Susan, but I'm getting close. Huh? Let me just, I'll just try to keep it moving along. So we're going to talk about allocation issues, uh, you know, speaking generally, a catch share, that's a term used to describe a fishery management program where shares of quotas are ex assigned more ex ex explicitly to individuals, to communities, to um, associations of, of some sort. And the recipient of the catch share is directly accountable for, on an annual basis, falling, fishing in a manner that, uh, that, that acts within the constraints of that individual share. Uh, oftentimes, accompanying that assignment of a cat share on the part of the regulatory agency is more flexibility to fish uh, outside of traditional management boundaries, uh, to, uh, providing that the that the uh, the fisherman or the or the or the cat share owning entity remains within that overall quota. So there's a trade-off here, which is we'll give you a little more flexibility from a management end. You take a little more responsibility for meeting your share. These shares also generally are assigned uh, by way of a privilege over a period of time. So if you own a if, if or if you control a percentage of a share of a stock in year one, and that stock increases in size going into year two, three, four, or five, your actual 
quota then would rise as that total allowable catch would rise. So, the, so in addition to having this here and now flexibility and this here and now opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, time bringing fish to the market at, at, at on occasion when it is most valuable to you, uh, you also have invested now a greater opportunity to see the value of your share grow over time as conservation measures take effect and you also thereby very directly um, eliminate in many respects this uh, traditional challenge associated with the tragedy of commons where even if I have a particular conservation ethic that I want to employ in my fishing behavior I don't necessarily operate with a sense of confidence that everybody else in the fishery uh, is acting in the same way therefore my uh, my conservation ethic, my conservation mo mo motivation is in fact undermined in, a fa in some fashion by my uncertainty with respect to what uh, other members of the fishery are doing in any given, in any given fishing season. So I want to just talk, uh, uh, I do want to note that yesterday uh, as I was sitting here we also released our national catch share policy. Our national catch share policy does not mandate the application of catch share systems in fisheries, uh, nor does it set any numeric quotas that the agency aspires to meet. It does say that we encourage councils to evaluate the opportunity associated with catch share systems when they make important management decisions, and it does say that we will work with them both, both on a tech, from a technical perspective and from the perspective of providing resources uh, to help them implement catch share programs uh, should they choose to so implement them. I'm going to show you this graph, which, can you guys see those numbers? Okay. I can't unless I put my glasses on. But uh, this, this is specific to the Northeast groundfish catch as it relates to sector implementation in 2010. And it tells a rather interesting story because it compares on the left uh, for, a, for a series of stocks in the groundfish fishery, on the left a set of uh, columns that relate to sector based performance and on the right the common pool. So as you heard a little bit yesterday, uh, fishermen could elect into sectors uh, that was generally based at least to some degree their ability to do so on their catch history, uh, but it was a free uh, opportunity to associate and aggregate uh, according to their uh, catch histories and business interests. And everybody that didn't elect to go into sectors remained in a common pool. So you could, you could at least posit the argument that um, some of the opportunity to employ the uh, creativity and ingenuity of fishermen uh, I I under the sector program and under the latitude afforded participants in the sectors um, w should show up in these catch patterns and that the common pool catch patterns might be more reflective of historical challenges associated with, uh, with management of this multi-species fishery. Uh, so what you see here in those stocks is uh, some stocks in the groundfish fishery are uh, considered to be limiting stocks. That is when we catch the annual quota of the limiting stock. It has the, uh, uh, the effect of shutting down the fishery even for uh, stocks that are healthier and for which we have not uh, secured uh, the total allowable catch for the year. Uh, so there's a chronic underperformance associated with this groundfish fishery in relation to the total allowable catch that is driven by uh, this limiting stock problem. And the thing I really want to focus on here is the fact that um, some of the highlighted stocks represent some of the limiting stocks uh, that are looked upon uh, across the region. And while uh, limiting stocks change from place to place in New England, um, these are fairly representative. And so what you see is that, for example, Gulf of Maine cod, uh, the sector operations have uh, caught 38% of the total allowable catch um, through this time period, compared to 88% of um, the same species for the common pool. And you see, as you go down the line, um, a number of species for which uh, the common pool has caught a significantly higher percentage, um, thereby uh, 
exposing them to um, either fishery shutdown or in the case of the common pool under the current management plan, much more restrictive um, fishing regulations. And while the sectors are at least in aggregate employing uh, some measure of uh, ingenuity, creativity to work around the, uh, the, the, the limiting stocks and secure and provide at least the opportunity to secure a higher percentage of the healthier stocks. Now, let me place an important caveat here. This is aggregate data. This does not represent the experience of every individual fisherman or um, the likely success of every individual sector. And so we understand that this aggregate data only tells a part of the story. We understand that there are incredible and very important economic challenges associated with early implementation of this sector program that continue to require analysis, that continue to require action on the part of the council, on the part of the agency, and, the, and on the part of a number of the other management partners um, to make sure that we affect a smooth um, and appropriate transition as we move toward, as we move into this sector program. But there is, um, as evidenced by this graph, some, something there um, to take advantage of, something there to build on, to, on an annual basis going forward, get closer to realizing the full uh, potential of this, uh, of this fishery, even as we rebuild some of these weaker stocks. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on this just because of uh, time. Uh, I want to talk about science just very quickly. We talked about, uh, uh, we, uh, I, I talked at the outset about, the, ch about the, the challenges associated with effectively describing what's going on out there. It continues to be a major uh, point of contention in many, many fisheries. Um, in some cases, uh, we, we, we know that we, we always operate based upon best, best available science. We know that in many places uh, we would always like to have better, more timely, uh, more accurate, and more precise science, uh, but we operate within um, the world that we operate in. At the same time, it is really important that we work very closely with um, particularly the fishing community um, to at least do whatever we can to create closer alignment between our assessment of the current reality and the fishermen's assessment of the current reality. Uh, and oftentimes you'll hear argument um, that we're way off base and um, sometimes occasionally that's true and uh, sometimes that's not true. What fishermen do to, to um, uh, to, in effect, measure stocks is go to the places where there are the most fish, where they historically know there are the most fish and catch them. Surveys don't operate that way, and there's a natural uh, distinction there that we need to recognize going forward. But we do also recognize uh, the need to continue to invest, and I, I thought I had a slide that I'm not ready for yet, but uh, continue to invest in better science and continue to invest in um, cooperative science that focused on engaging fishermen more directly in the, um, in the, in the survey process. There's another part of um, cooperative research, by the way, which has been very effective over the years, and that um, is um, prosecuted by fishermen for the purposes of testing more selective gear, uh, testing gear that is more habitat friendly, um, and that is another whole realm of um, cooperative science that uh, that, that we have funded in the past and continue to place great emphasis on going forward. All right, I'm really close. So I just wanted to mention uh, Marine Recreational Information Program. Uh, one of the other big challenges, uh, uh, shortcomings associated with um, historical fisher fisheries management was our ability to effectively characterize the catch and effort within uh, recreational fisheries. Uh, there are, you know, interestingly, not a whole lot of recreational constituents represented in this room, but um, in some parts of the country, uh, the, it's a dominant factor in our management challenge uh, in the South Atlantic, in the Gulf, uh, many other places, and we have underway uh, significant efforts to um, focus on improving our ability to measure recreational catch and effort. So unlike commercial data, where we get real... Um, actual uh, landings data, recreational uh, effort and catch is, uh, is collected through survey-based methodology that provides 
estimates that, uh, that you know, often are challenged by um, participants. So I mentioned cooperative research already. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to say a word or two about, and, and you'll have the pleasure, by the way, of seeing me again on the, um, on, on the second panel today. And uh, I'll be able to talk a little bit more about uh, the o ocean policy and coastal and marine spatial planning uh, on that panel. But I did want to uh, note uh, as a kind of a conclusion here that, um, as we heard yesterday, there are a lot of new challenges out there. They're geographic, they're uh, functional in the different kinds of um, uses in coastal and ocean areas that, that, that either have to coexist with or have the potential to, in some fashion, affect fisheries. And uh, ocean policy and coastal and marine spatial planning, we believe, represents a very significant opportunity a, sig a significant place where many of those diverse interests can come together and much more effectively uh, plan, share information, and make long-term management decisions with respect to uh, coastal and ocean areas and resources. Uh, and, and so I'll say more about this later, but it, is, uh, it, it does present, we think, great promise to address uh, particularly a number of the things that came up in conversation yesterday with respect to uh, conflicts that exist out there on the ocean. So, so I'm going to stop there. I do very much appreciate the opportunity to share a few of these thoughts with you. And um, so I did save at least 15 minutes for Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> Dennis. We have been in the Northeast, I think, contributed tremendously to the wealth of fisheries case law uh, that have helped your agency develop and refine its plans. But just last week, uh, a very significant lawsuit was filed on the West Coast by the Greater Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen. I get three or four small boat fisheries groups filed suit against uh, you uh, and the agency, uh, saying that the catch share program that has been proposed there is, has a violates national standard number eight, ignores the needs of small boat fishermen in favor of consolidation of larger factory trawlers. I know you can't comment directly on laws that have just been filed, but can you talk about that tension between national standard number eight and some of these consolidation programs that are going around, around the country? Yeah, so uh, not commenting specifically on that case, but, uh, you know, you know, I alluded this. I alluded to this in my earlier commentary, and that that is that. Uh, you know, there's this. There's a there's a you know there's a certain uh, independent of of cat share systems, independent of ITQ systems. Uh, we have a we have a number of fisheries that are overcapitalized. Uh, we have a number of fisheries that are targeting stocks that have been. Um, in decline or that are, because of rebuilding requirements, um, suffering su substantial uh, constraints in comparison to past, uh, you know, quotas. We also have fisheries that are facing significant bycatch issues, whether it relates to um, other fish stocks that are in rebuilding plans or protected resources like, uh, like you know, like marine mammals and, and sea turtles. And so there is, uh, a there, there is a requirement, again, independent of cat share systems, for um, the councils working with the fishermen to find that right spot. And that right spot, as it relates to you know, the, you know, the allocation of what's available, probably in many cases won't necessarily reflect uh, historical fishing opportunity that was associated with perhaps, you know, less attention to bycatch issues or higher levels of abundance um, in stocks. And so it's, it, 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 which is one of the reasons that we say that, uh, it's one of the reasons that councils are, are an important part of the process. It's also when you talk about cat share systems, one of the reasons that we say very explicitly that cat share systems have got to be designed with local, uh, local needs, sort of a local vision as to what that future fishery might look like in place, and, and it needs to take account um, for the, uh, geographic uh, diversity, for diversity in uh, gear types, big boats, small boats, uh, et, 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 et cetera. And that's a conversation that really has to happen in those, in those places. Um, 
to be sort of reflective of, you know, local community visions for the future of their fisheries. And there are trade-offs between, you know, sort of maximum efficiency and maximum capture and, and some of these kind of social, uh, some of these social goals. And finding that trade-off is from place to place, a very, finding that right place is, you know, a very different thing from place to place. And frankly, it's, a, you know, a very different thing from fisherman to fisherman. That, that's part of what's, you know, the struggle that's underway, you know, again, independent of catch share systems all over the all over the country as, as we look to the future of fisheries. It's happening in the Pacific Northwest with the trawl IQ. It's happening um, in New England with sectors. And it's a dialogue that we just have to continue to have so that we find a way forward that, you know, again, not only not only looks for the right economic mix, but also protects um, the, uh, you know, the social uh, uh, the social goals that we seek to protect locally. I will say this about the trawl IQ out there, and that is that they do have a, um, a specific component of the plan which includes a set aside, uh, a quota set aside to address um, some of the small, small communities, remote community concerns that are out there. And that part of that plan is still um, very much under development. Um, you know, I think as we saw, you know, sectors get implemented here in New England. Um, you know, there was also at the same time an awareness that, you know, the, the, the initial plan was not the be all to end all, and there will be adjustments in these programs going forward to address some of those concerns. Uh, yeah, Peter. Eric, Peter Shelley from uh, CLF. I, I couldn't help noticing from your maps of the country, the overfish, overfishing stocks, that the only group that's competing with the New England Council for the most overfished and most overfishing are the stocks that you manage, uh, the highly migratory stocks. <laughs> and, um, I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. These are some of the most iconic fish in the ocean, top of the food chain. And, and could you tease that apart a little bit about why is why are you having so many problems? Are there scientific differences between the countries? Are there political differences between the countries that are engaged in these highly migratory fisheries? Is it management within NIMS that needs to be strengthened? Uh, what, what are the components of, of reducing your um, your presence on that map. So I guess I should paraphrase the question for the purposes of taping, and that is uh, the, 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 you know, what it means that there are significant uh, highly migratory species challenges um, still evident in our, uh, in our management framework. Uh, so I think the answer, Peter, is all of the above. I, you know, obviously there are, uh, you know, continued uh, debates over um, science, there's a continued need for improved science in many of these stocks, but there are also tremendous challenges, uh, you know, in the international world in uh, uh, taking um, domestic understandings and domestic positions into international arenas and, uh, you know, affecting some kind of a, some kind of a positive outcome. I, I, you know, I think it's probably you may take issue with this, fair, but fair to say that in general, um, as it relates not only to the management of these stocks, but to um, the management of these fisheries within the context of some of the other things that we hold dear, like, uh, like sea turtles and marine mammals, that the U.S. is pretty um, uh, progressive in its, in its uh, thinking and application of uh, you know, fishery management regulations um, to that effect, um, much more so in some cases than uh, some of the other, uh, some of the other, uh, uh, you know, countries that we encounter. And so that, so that's, that's a, a constant challenge. Um, you know, there are big quota fights, as you well know, um, that s sort of, you know, in, in many cases, uh, undermine you know any kind of a conservation based uh, threshold that we might establish and the, the, the point that I made about Magnuson now sort of drawing that sh that hard line between uh, conservation and uh, and addressing allocation fights is in many of those international venues um, not as not as clear a line or much more easily crossed on a regular basis um, I will I will also um, mention that one of the other things that we have I alluded to this, this um, focus on improved engagement in, in, in the international arena. 
And one of the things that the Magnuson 2006 reauthorization established was a position within NOAA expressly for the purposes of doing a better job in the international arena. And we were very fortunate not that long ago to have brought on Russell Smith as our new Deputy Undersecretary for um, International Fisheries Issues. Uh, Russell's primary job is number one, and he comes to us from uh, the U.S. Trade Representative, so we think he's got the right, uh, you know, he's got the right resume to take on this task, is to do a better job of advancing U.S. perspectives, U.S. positions in these uh, various international uh, arenas, um, not only individual but in a more coordinated fashion so that when we're dealing with tuna issues in the Western Pacific, um, we might also be thinking about how we're dealing with tuna issues in, um, in the Atlantic and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So a uh, lot of work to be done, but uh, we at least have a renewed emphasis on it. I think we're um, getting a little bit of traction in a few places, and, uh, and hopefully that will continue. Okay, uh, so Dan is asking specifically about the National Angler Registry. Uh, one of the things that, that I sort of glossed over is that part of the Marine Recreational Information Program improvement that was prescribed in uh, the Magnuson Act was uh, in the 2006 reauthorization was a national creation of a National Angler Registry, which would provide for us a better database um, from which to get to, to, to uh, launch efforts to survey uh, recreational fishermen. And so one of the things that the, that the uh, statute set up was an opportunity for um, states to essentially put into place a, a comparable, acceptable program that would generate that data in lieu of a National Angler Registry. At this point, we've got two states um, that have not put in place accepted uh, state level registry processes. One is Hawaii, the other is New Jersey. So you, you allude, Dan, to some issues in Maine, but there is a program in place. The beginning, the beginning states is one. Yeah, okay. So the, so the states that either had a, a, some sort of a recreational license or didn't have one um, would have expanded that recreational license um, both in scope number of participants as well as in uh, the type of information that was requested to essentially enable this, um, this effective survey process. Uh, and um, so we work very closely with states all around the country, not only you know, in helping to support uh, factually what the differences were between the national registry and what the state registry opportunities might offer going forward, and I think that had um, a lot to do with a number of the states that did effectively move forward. Um, the states that haven't gone forward that I mentioned will continue to participate through a national internet-based um, registration process that we, uh, that we administer. And that really will become, that becomes sort of only just one of the foundational pieces to doing a better job of um, better assessing recreational catch and effort. So we'll have this more discrete um, survey base but we have to couple that with improved dockside surveys, uh, as well as a number of other uh, number of other elements that relate to for higher sector and the like, um, to really generate a better um, overall picture of uh, and more precise picture of uh, recreational catch and effort going forward. So what we'll see actually just going into 2011, the first um, implementation of angler registry based surveys um, that will go at least initially side by side with the traditional survey so that we'll be able to we'll be able to assess the, the, the differences and so I'm not sure Dan if that answers your question but that's kind of the, the state of the world in that on that issue. Yes. Um, Jan Two on um, replacing old gear with better gear. 
to reduce bycatch and destruction of habitats. Uh, is there more that you at NOAA or we can do to foster that either through in combination with catch shares or providing incentives and research? And is that part of the plan to preserve? Okay, so the, the question is uh, sort of in the context of overcapitalization, uh, are we um, still talking about buyouts and uh, number one, and secondly, what are the uh, uh, opportunities associated, to, you know, the, the associated opportunities to support uh, uh, newer gear, gear research that is more selective, more habitat friendly, the like. Uh, well, let me say this. First of all, I, you know, I think that um, one of the real promising uh, aspects of uh, catch shares is that, they, is that once you achieve some rationalization initially, um, it eliminates sort of the motivation which is, originates from this tragedy of the commons to essentially pursue a, a, you know, a fisheries arms race, right? And so, so once you rationalize, once you move into a catch share program, now a fisherman is, is only going to deploy as much gear, that, the, the gear that he or she needs to secure the quota that, they, that has been assigned to them. And they're not going to feel like they're in constant competition. Again, it's sort of an arms race mentality with other fishermen who are, share, who are fishing, you know, just to maximize capture of, the, of you know, a shared quota. Uh, you know, buyouts can be a, an, an, can be a part of the transition process, right? So, as I, you know, alluded to in the in um, answering Dennis's question, that you know the challenge is in that transition. Um, not only not only is the challenge associated with sort of visioning where you want to be, but when you decide where you want to be and you set in course the actions to move in that direction, how do you deal with the people? Um, that are that are left out of that process, and you know buyouts can be an important part of that process. Our general posture with respect to buyouts is that um, we look very heavily to um, to the councils, to that local um, visioning, that local design process uh, to inform the need for uh, some kind of a buyout. Where there is a buyout, we're we're certainly per, uh, where there is a buyout option that's being explored. We're certainly happy, and in many cases have um, provide, provided whatever technical support we can to um, to help affect an appropriate, you know, an, a, you know, an appropriate implementation, appropriate design and implementation. Uh, obviously, these things are, uh, you know, historically much hampered by money or lack thereof. I don't think that's going to um, change appreciably going forward. So it's a you know, it's a real issue that we'll continue to face, you know, in some of these transitional uh, phases of some of these fisheries. Uh, you know, as it relates to gear, uh, you know, absolutely, I mentioned uh, our strong interest in continuing to support cooperative research that is specifically focused on um, design and, and testing and utilization of gear that is more selective as it relates to, you know, uh, you know, all kinds of bycatch, you know, protected resources, uh, other fish, et cetera, uh, as well as gear that is more habitat friendly. And, uh, you know, I think both of those things are going to be, uh, you know, more important going forward even than they have been in the past. Okay, so how about up in the back here? Hi, uh, Kevin Edson and uh, Navy Conservancy. Um, one thing we have talked about much here yet is the uh, diagnosis of fish, and NOAA has spent possibly hundreds of millions of dollars over the years destroying spawning habitat access. Um, and then some people would say that the fisheries for many of those species, whether it's salmon or, or river heritage, um, get clobbered out in the marine environment for a host of reasons. Uh, and I'm just, I guess I'm just curious, as an NGO that's a little bit on the restoration side, uh, if there's any renewed interest in trying to figure out ways to not be working at potentially cost purposes for the species. Yeah, thanks. Kevin, right? Yes. So, uh, so Kevin asked about, uh, uh, particularly as it relates to diadromous species, um, species that, you know, migrate. Um, inshore, upriver systems, and and then and then spend parts of their life uh, offshore. Uh, 
you know, whether we're trying to do a better job to sort of sync up the offshore management um, to match some of the commitment of inshore resources to improve access to spawning rivers and rebuild populations and the like. And I, 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 the answer is absolutely. I mean, we see that, uh, you know, in a number of different stocks. We see, you know, it's a constant issue out in, in California as we deal with, um, you know, the salmon life cycle and the need to, in some cases, uh, you know, close ocean fisheries to allow populations to rebuild. Uh, I, th I think it's also, you know, these are, by the way, sort of, um, you know, two of my favorite things to talk about, you know, one being habitat, particularly as it relates to inshore and upland habitat, which are so important to so many of these, um, these diadermous species. Um, and then again, this kind of um, more comprehensive linkage of, um, uh, of, of the need to not only to understand the, uh, the life cycles, the movements, and, and you know, characterize the, the, the choke points, if you will, in that process, but, um, but then to manage accordingly. And it's a constant issue for us, Kevin. It, 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 you know, I alluded to the West Coast salmon issues. We have big salmon bycatch issues that we're, that we're trying to manage with some of the um, Alaska fisheries. We have you know, East Coast bycatch issues. You mentioned river herring. Uh, you know, shad and the like um, that have long been uh, uh, a focal point of, you know, uh, of, of uh, management concern as we try to sync up the, the right protections. And it's, it's, a, it, it's a huge challenge from a scientific perspective because it, it's a process that lends itself to sort of, you know, offshore pointing inshore and inshore pointing offshore and it's not me, it's that other guy. And so it presents what I think is an incredible first and foremost sort of scientific challenge to be able to effectively characterize the, the current reality to thereby minimize that kind of don't mess with us because until you fix that and, and vice versa. So uh, it's a real issue. It's something we pay a lot of attention to. And it's, it's also something we work very closely with the states on because of the, the, the inshore uh, uh, you know, component to management of a lot of these fisheries. So that's probably not maybe as precise an answer as you were looking for, but it's in the scope of the problem. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, I look forward to it.